All right, so this is a chunky chapter, feature engineering with uh, recipes. Uh, and so John defined our objective. So we have, we have a fair amount of ground to cover. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'll let you look at that when we, the RMD is uploaded, but um, let's start off with what is feature engineering? It's basically the process of reformatting your pre pre predictor values. Uh, it includes, but is not limited to transformations, encodings, et cetera. So in other words, you have your predictors and then you run it through a bunch of steps and transformations so that you, um, you have it in the form that you want and which makes more sense to your model. If certain predictors are highly correlated, then you can actually remove those features or you can do a, a, a dimension a reduction. And so that way, highly correlated features can actually, um, you know, they can be lumped together. Uh, there's imputation for missing values and, uh, and a whole lot more. So uh, let's, so while Connor, uh, I guess, yeah, well, we already looked at this earlier. Uh, I'm just gonna run through quickly uh, some of the columns that we'll be specifically focusing on. Um, and we are particularly gonna be looking at the sale price, the neighborhood, uh, the, the living area, the year that the, the building was constructed and the building type for this particular uh, session. Um, it does return um, a, all the columns that the data set has. So it's, I mean, even though we are looking at a smaller set here, um, here we can see that um, these are factor variables and- Wait, are you pointing to, we only see the browser window? Oh, wait, <laughs> what do you mean? You, you, you don't see, what? So wait, you're not seeing the, you don't see 6.2 a quick survey we select columns? Here, uh, no, we see 6.1. What is feature engineering? At least I do. Oh, what, what about, oh, wait, let's see. Is there a lag here? Is that better? I think you might only be sharing the browser window instead of the whole screen. Oh, oh okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. Let's um, let me get the hmm. screen. Okay, that's weird. Um, okay, well, let's see how. Um, no, sorry, no. I'm gonna try this again. That's bizarre. Sorry, one second. Um, sorry about that. Okay, let's try this again. Screen share. Okay. Um, okay. Do you see it now? It says six point two. A quick survey of select columns. Now we do. Yes. Okay, well, hopefully when I advance it, it'll stay that way. Okay, so this makes a, uh, goes through a quick breakdown of what, um, what the data types are. So you can see that the neighborhood has uh, uh, 28 different uh, levels, 28 unique levels, and then the, there's five different building types. And uh, these are the continuous variables, the sale price, um, the living area, and of course, the year that it was built. So I just wanted to quickly show the how skewed the the price of this is. So, I mean, clearly there's definitely a skew here because it's uh, it's not log transformed at this point and which is why in subsequent slides, um, you will see that they, uh, it goes through a process of log transforming this um, because of the skewed nature of it. But uh, do you see 6.3 now or is there still an issue? We see 6.3, so all good. Okay, cool, okay. So let's talk about training and test sets. So before we get started, we're gonna go ahead and um, we're going to split the aims data set uh, and i think asma mentioned this but we are going to stratify this uh, by the sale price and the reason is because it's uh, you don't want to have a training set where you know you have the exorbitantly priced homes in one of your um, one like if you're going to do resampling for example that one of your resamples might have it and the others might not have as much of a distribution so it's going to be stratified by the sale price and we set up the, the train and the test models. Uh, we already saw that we have um, a neighborhood with qualitative data. Um, we have the living area, which is a continuous variable, the year that it was uh, built, and then the, the type of uh, building. So um, 
I am not going to get into this because I think that's part of chapter 10, but I will leave you with this slide where uh, this is how uh, Max approaches uh, resampling and maybe this is how it's always done, but you, the, the training set is, is the one that's typically broken up into uh, equal size sets. And I think he, uh, he does the 10 CV fold, uh, the cross validation sets out of which um, 90% is used for um, the analysis and 10% is the, the holdout, which is later used for the assessment. So um, this, this is how he, um, he does his uh, resampling test. He, he uses the training. And so when you talk about resampling, he does not like it. If you bring testing, the, the test set into it, it's, it's, all, it's all related to the training set. So um, here is a standard call to uh, DLM, um, where this is your sale price and you're using your, the neighborhood the lock, um, uh, your lock transforming the living area, the year built and the building type. And this is the same thing in the form of a recipe. So this particular recipe does have this as a formula. You can also do it another way where you specify the roles and you can have predictors and outcomes in, in, in those roles. But in this particular case, it has been, uh, it's been defined like how you would in, in a formula. Um, it, the, this one has been log transformed, as you can see, the living area and the, the step dummy is basically converting all nominal. Uh, and here, John, I'm wondering, is this the one that was deprecated? Because I only realized subsequently that uh, you had said that something was, uh, was it this it, or? It's not actually deprecated, but he's, okay. uh, they, they're going to have, what is it, all nominal predictors or all something like that. Um, okay. They're adding a more explicit uh, function because people are confused that nominal can actually transform your um, your outcome variable. Oh, okay. So just to make the distinction between the predictor and the outcome, it's, it's going to have something a little bit more clearly defined. Yes. There. Okay, yep. got it. Okay. So um, the step dummy is, uh, so, and what all nominal says is that anything that's factor or character you encode it because when you pass something into the LM formula, you necessarily have to be numeric in nature. So that's what this step is doing. It's converting all nominal um, variables into uh, dummy variables here. And when you look at the output of this, you see that here, even though you didn't expli explicitly state what was an outcome and what was a predictor, uh, it's already done it for you. You have one outcome, which is that, and these are all your pred predictors. And it also, uh, since you've included the steps here, it tells you what uh, transformations were done. So you did a long transformation on your living area and you dummy, uh, you had a dummy variable for your, um, um, well, for the building type. Yeah, so the building type was also log transformed, but um, yeah, that's right. So th it doesn't explicitly say that it was done on the building type, but then that's that's what this is, that it, it did do it on the nominal variables. Okay, so what's happening inside of recipes? Recipe is an object that specifies the steps. So it actually is not executed. All you're doing is that you're specifying the steps and you are specifying the roles of the variables. So whether something is a predictor predictor or something is an outcome. Um, and then you have the various steps that indicate what needs to be transformed or what needs to be converted um, uh, from you know, a qualitative to a quantitative format. So the step log uh, declares that the living area needs to be log transformed. And the step dummy is basically converting all the nominal variables into a quantitative format. And this is actually a binary numeric variable with the columns of zeros and, uh, and ones. So now that you specified that in your recipe, we can actually estimate that using our training set. So we use the prep function here and we pass uh, our uh, training set. We, the simple aims is nothing but the recipe that we defined earlier uh, here. That is the name of the recipe. And um, here we pass the training set and here I explicitly declared ret retain to be true. So when you say that, you want the original data set to be maintained, it means that you can actually get it back. So let's say that you prep your, uh, your recipe and then you wanna be able to see what your prepared or your trained data set looks like after you, you prepped it. If you, if you set this particular parameter to true, then you can actually retain the original data set that you fed that. And John, I'm not sure if I said that 
completely accurately. So feel free to jump in and correct me. Okay, so can you guys hear me? Yeah, uh, I'm setting up the uh, GitHub repo for tomorrow night's book club. So if anyone else can uh, correct, they are welcome ah. to jump in. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. I think, so I think on that, by the way, isn't uh, retain equals true? Isn't that the default there? I think that's the default. I I actually thought that it was not because I I ran this the first time without this, and then I could not get it. But it's completely conceivable that I did something else wrong. So I thought. Well, I think by default it would not be true because what if your data set was like enormous and you didn't want that thing to be sitting around? It is It is true by default. Oh, it is true by default? Yeah. yeah. So oh, what, okay. what this does is when you're prepping it, since it has to go through all that steps, it's doing that calculus and already, so it's just saving that. So you don't have to run another, uh, another calculus and then that. So it's just saving some computation time. Yeah, right. So, um, so we prepped it here, right? So we we specified our recipe, and now we are actually estimating it by using our training set. Uh, and for like, it's it's basically what we saw earlier. But here, um, I just wanted to show you uh, how many rows your training set has. So the original count was about, I believe, um, two thousand nine hundred and something. So your training set has two one nine nine, and your test set has about seven hundred or. 800 rows. And you can also use your tidy functions to look at what um, this uh, or this particular data set has after it has been, um, uh, pre uh, sorry, not prepared. Yeah, after it has been prepared and you can see that it has, um, it, it lists out your steps, whatever steps you did on your data. The first step was of course a log transformation. It assigns an ID and you can actually set the ID that you want here. And the second step was the dummification of your, um, uh, the building type, and that also has been assigned an ID. And you can actually go back later and look at these particular steps using this um, ID. Okay, so, so now that you've finished your pre-processing, you can apply this uh, pre-processed recipe to any uh, data set. So we are gonna use a simple AIMS recipe and we are specifying new data because now we are gonna run the, the test set through this with this recipe. And when you look at this, I did a head on this just to, you know, because it's, it's got a whole bunch of columns. You see the living area, which was law transformed, the year build, which was numeric, so we did nothing with it. The sale price, which was law transformed, have been retained the way they are. But the neighborhood, as you can see, it has a prefix of neighborhood underscore now. So um, when you uh, dummy, since, since we also created dummy um, variables on this, this was one of the, the, um, the one of the nominal uh, variables, it prefixes it with this particular, and I think you can custom set whatever you would like it to prefix that particular value with. So there's, there's about 28 different neighborhoods, I believe, and all of them would be neighborhood underscore college creek, whatever, and they, um, they have, um, um, they have, they have, they've all been uh, dummified. So this is your table of that particular test data set. Okay, and uh, what you see here is that this is your living area, this is the year build, and this was the sale price, but then the rest of them are the different neighborhoods, and then of course the building type. So it, it just gives you a count of how many um, rows there are. So N is 731, because that's the number of rows in your test uh, data set and um, just a bunch of different summary statistics. So if you specify your new underscore data to null, that means you wanna get back your training set. So that's why it's important. Well, okay, I, re I actually thought that uh, it's that, that thing is set to true. I, I didn't realize that this was set to true by default, but um, this is basically just a way that if you say that new underscore data is null, as opposed to setting it to your test data set like we did here, it just gives you back your training set. So that way you don't have to run all your computations again. So you, you can bake it, but you can set your new data to null just to get back your, your training set. So um, any questions so far? Actually, let me take a look at chat real quick. 
Okay, so uh, I think when we looked at neighborhoods, we saw that we had about 28 or 29 different uh, levels. And if you line up these just to see the frequency, uh, you can see that some of them, like they are like pretty infrequent, like they, they fall below a certain threshold. So one thing you can do is just lump the ones that you are not like terribly interested in, like in, into like an other category and just look at the ones which are you know, like um, have a higher frequency. So then that way you, uh, you're you not working with as many levels. And so I believe we select the, the largest eight. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the rest are kind of lumped into an other um, category. And so to do that, um, we go back to the same um, recipe. Um, and here we have an additional step where we have step underscore other. So we're going to pass it the neighborhood variable, but then we've set a threshold for anything less than 10% of your total frequency. That is all going to fall into this other category. So if you look at your, um, your, if you go back to your steps and you look at what you have here, you can see that it has collapsed your factor levels for the neighborhood. And then the rest of them remain the same. And then of course, all, all nominal um, variables have been converted into, have been dummified. So that's another step function. So I think we've probably seen about three or four step functions so far. So the, this thing is kind of interesting. Um, your dummy variables, they are stored, they are binary encoded. So it's like zeros and ones. And we have five different levels here for building type. So what we're looking here at here is building type. And this is your one family, whatever. So there's five different levels, but you actually only have four. Uh, values. So it's always the number of categories minus one. And the reason for this, and this really confused me till such time as I realized that it's pretty similar to what happens in interactions in between categorical variables in like just simple inferential statistics. Uh, I had a hard time wrapping my brain around why you, you needed like n minus one uh, until I went back to um, uh, modern die, which does a really great job of looking at uh, inferential statistics and the interaction effects. So I just uh, segued a little bit just to pull in this from modern die. There is an interaction effect if the effect of one variable depends on the value of another variable. So not in addition to the individual components, you also have an interaction com uh, interaction component between those two variables. And that is, um, is um, what is actually talked about here. So just to segue a little bit here, they're looking at the impact of age and gender on a teaching score. And so um, this is this comes from one of the data sets in the modern dive uh, package. And um, we actually what is done here is that um, you see this, um, the into sign actually depicts interaction between age and gender. So what is the interaction between age and gender on the outcome variable, which is score. And what it is, is that your um, all categorical variables are um, alphabetically uh, ordered. So female is, the F is higher than M. So the intercept and age are actually of female. That forms the baseline. And everything is offset relative to that. So uh, in other words, this is the, the, the intercept. And this would be your um, the, the slope. And this would be the corresponding offset from the female. So gender male is the offset from the female intercept and age gender male is the offset from the female age slope. I, I hope that's a little bit clear. So basically what it's saying is that uh, for every increase in um, score, there's a negative correlation with your age. So in other words, as age goes up, your score goes down or as your score, uh, well, as your, yeah, well, it's, it's a negative uh, uh, relationship, but it's less negative for a male because when you subtract out, it's when it's minus 0 0.018 plus uh, 0 0.014, it's, it's like uh, minus zero point minus zero point zero zero four. So it's it's less negative for a male. So in other words, a male is not as impacted by age with regards to his um, teaching score. So um, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that 
your intercept and the, there's a certain baseline and everything is sort of an offset off of that. And that's basically what's, um, it's similar to this concept here and why we have one level less than um, what, uh, what, what actually needed to be encoded. This forms your, your base and everything else would be uh, relative. I mean, well, I'm saying that wrong. This would be the intercept. Is this correct? Or am I totally messing this up? Because in the book, he talks about how if um, you had the same number of levels, then it would, it would be stacked right up to your intercept. So I don't know if I'm saying it right, though. Yeah, I think that's um, that. Yeah, I think that makes sense to me, um, the way you're explaining that. Yeah. Well, one I kind of, sorry, go ahead. Oh, just like one fam is the default kind of thing. So like any of the binary indicators for the others would indicate whichever it is. Right, so it would, it would be implicitly assumed from that and yeah. But I'm not quite sure that the segue into interaction effects was necessary. I, I think I just wanted to make the point that it's used as sort of a baseline. And it's kind of offset from that. But if that just confused people, I'm sorry for that. Um, OK, so let's see here. OK, so how do we encode interactions? And the first, the first thing you see here is just your straight formula. Uh, you have the, the colon here, which, um, which is the interaction between the living area, the building type. And, um, and this is how you would do it if you were just encoding your formula. That is in a recipe, you have a step and the step underscore interact uh, basically has, um, it's actually still a formula because if you notice, this is one of the few steps that has a tilde in front of it. And the tilde means that you still are operating at the level of a formula, but it's just, it's still part of a step. So that's something to keep in mind that the rest of your steps don't have the tilde, but this one does. And I think they wanted to, he wanted to pretty much pull this up with anything that has a building type. So this is kind of like dplyr, you can use a card, you can see anything that starts with building type, you would uh, create an interaction. Um, uh, you, you would check to see if there was any interaction. And since these have already been dummified, you, you are actually applying the interaction to the dummies in your prior steps since they're going sequentially. So if you looked at this now, you would see that now we have four steps, right? And then uh, because you have one, two, three, and four, and the first one is a log, the other one is another dummy and interact, and you have the IDs. And you can actually have, you have another parameter here where you can set the ID uh, variable uh, ID uh, value as well. And then that way, if you wanted to go in and take a look at your steps, you can pull it by ID. Okay, so this is just a little bit more like getting into a few more steps and what you can do. So splines are, um, I mean, if you were fitting a linear model, but you had a slightly nonlinear component to your data, like you, you were looking at something that was, that didn't really fall into the linear paradigm, you can still convert, you can kind of linearize your data by, applying uh, splines to it. And this, this determining how many spline terms you need, that's really uh, more an aspect of parameter tuning or hype. I don't know if it can be called hyperparameter tuning, but um, it's, uh, he, I know Max, like in one of his presentations called it like tuning parameter or parameter tuning. So I wanted to actually, um, uh, I wanted, I wanted dibs on chapter 12 because that gets into overfitting, which, I have been famous for doing. So if no one else is terribly keen on presenting, I would love to do that. Um, so here, I just wanted to quickly just show you what splines do. This is just a, um, just looking at the latitude. And I, I hear it, he's only looking at the latitude relative to the sale price. And you can see here that when you have uh, two, five, 20, and 100 spline terms, this is, um, it's, it's relatively like there's really no uh, variability there at all. That is here, it starts to, you know, it's, it's a little bit better defined, but then a 20, I think you, you definitely start to see that it's, it's fitting it better. Whereas here, this, this is clearly looking like it's completely overfit in this case. So determining how many spline terms you want is, is actually what is parameter tuning. And you can play around with that till such time as you find a fit and uh, a number that you would like. I think um, five was okay, but I thought 20 was fairly decent. And I think 20 is what he uses correspondingly. 
Um, so this uh, is the same recipe as before, um, but now we have this additional step where we also bring in latitude and longitude. So if you notice, we have like more in our uh, recipe, we've added on more because we want to look at what effects they have as well. And now we've actually um, uh, used a step underscore N in this and the degrees of freedom are 20, like since we saw the 20 had, the, had a better definition there. So this is the same as before. We have um, all the steps defined and the IDs, et cetera, and whatnot. So another thing that we can do is if you're doing a PCA or something like that, and you just have a lot of features, um, you, you can collapse them or you can, um, you can, you can um, basically get it down to like what, um, what is it? What is one here? So here, um, all of the, um, the living area, I think they are um, suffixed with underscore SF if I'm not mistaken. And so he's trying to look at um, whatever matches SF or um, the great, the, whatever, the living area. And, um, and I think that's what it's, I'm not quite sure about the, what, what this regex is actually doing. Is it looking at either SF or the, the living area or I'm not sure, is that an or or is it something else? That is an or. Okay. Okay, so he's looking for anything that matches and then um, it's just a way of doing damage introduction. Um, I don't know if you wanna say anything there, uh, John, about uh, the BCA part. But if you like. uh, Nope, it's going well. <laughs> uh, so, okay, cool. Okay, so how? So now that we've got, we I think we finally have our the recipe as we want it. So this is our final recipe that we want to apply. So how are we going to use the data and apply our recipe to them? So if we just did recipe and and provided the data set, that that data set that you gave it would just be used to determine the data type of each column. So then that way, if you're doing something like all underscore nominal or all uh, ordinal, I'm sorry, all predictor underscore nominal or all outcome nominal, it would know which columns you were actually targeting. So that's literally what we did in the first few steps where we specified the recipe. That data set was used to establish the data types of all the columns in your data set. But when you get into prep and you get into bake, it actually starts to do, uh, you know, actually gets into a little bit more uh, detail there. So in your prep, you are estimating your, um, you're doing your estimation there. So anything that you're centering and scaling or any of your dummy dummifications or your log transformations or anything else, your dimension reduction, everything, all of those happen in your prep and you're, you're passing it the training set. So you want that to be as representative as possible because that's, that's gonna, it's gonna be standardized using that data. So the more, um, more diverse your training set is, the, you, you're going to have better representation, and your your recipe is better prepped on on that model on that data set. So, and then finally, when you actually want to run your your test data set, you you don't need to re-estimate anything because you've already standardized this and you've done your estimation. So you would just pass in your new data, and it would um, it would it would standardize it would standardize it based on whatever was estimated in your in your training set. Right. So then finally, we fit the model. So um, we have the final um, recipe, and this is how we prepped it. So, um, so if we prepped it with new data set to null, we would just get back our train set. Right. So any anytime your new underscore data has been set to null, you just get back your train set on which you prepped the the data. But if you actually bake it with your test set, then you get your test prep set. So once you have uh, prepped your training set, you will actually fit your model. So you pass it to this with your data set to your training prepped um, data set, and, and you, you, you can look at how, how well it has fit. So it's got R squared and the adjusted R squared, et cetera. So 0.8, so that's, that's pretty good. And 0.794 was your adjusted R square, but if you look at your, um, if you actually look at um, what your fit looks like here, you can you can see that um, 
you have 63 more rows. So mind you, we pulled in the, um, the building types, we have the interaction and we have the latitude and the longitude. So there's, um, there was a lot that we did with this. So even though we, um, can, we actually lumped a lot of the neighborhoods into other. So I, I'm sure that we have these and then the 11th one is probably like neighborhood underscore other. Since we created an other catch all group, we have all the others, which are all of the other uh, steps that we have there. So um, you can then use it to make your predictions using your test, uh, our test data set. I only have uh, the first six here, but the test data set actually had about 771 entries and you, you, you will get um, um, values for each of them. I'm guessing that it's probably the R squared or, um, oh, it's actually the, the prediction for your price. That's the sale price. Is that right? Yeah, that does look like it's the sale price, isn't it? That's a prediction of your sale price, that's correct. So that's yes. what it is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, wow, so some of them are like really huge. Um, and so then that would be your uh, predictions. And then of course you can you can go in and see, I mean, I, I didn't take it any further, but then you can actually go in and see how, how well you did, et cetera, by comparing your fitted against your, um, your observed and, and, you know, just, and your residuals, et cetera. So, um, that's all from me. So let me take a look at chat. Um, how confident should I be in buying a house in Ames with this model? Sorry, what did you say? I, I didn't hear that, Tony. I was saying, uh, how confident should I be in buying a house in Ames with this model? <laughs> well, you know, um, I have to say though, I was, uh, that's a good question. So there was something I saw here and I wanted to see if uh, what you guys thought. Um, so if you looked at that, um, wait, let me see. Was it the splines? I think it was the splines actually, hold on, let's go back there. I thought some of them were like really, like there were some, some outliers there, I thought. Okay, so if you look at this, there's like, there's like a lot of stuff here that's not being caught. Like, so this, it's it's clearly like, you know what I mean? Like the sale price is a lot higher, but the model is, I mean, like this is just not getting it, right? So I feel, I feel like there's something going on here. Like it's, uh, it's just not catching it. And I don't know, like, I, I felt like there's a lot here that seemed like there was more that we need, like we need to get in terms of the features. So I'm I'm not sure how how good this this recipe is, frankly. Um, so I guess one question I had, and maybe this is specific to this model of implementation, but they do have the the, the um, neighborhood in, in here as well as a term, right? Yeah. So how does that? Wouldn't that be is that redundant with the, well, with the longitude and latitude? Um, no, it's all, it's actually, it was one of the, do you remember the one where we converted it into other? Like we took the ones which were like most frequently, um, actually I think it was further up, sorry. I need to go back here, one second. Um, yeah, so if you look at this, um, you these are all the neighborhoods. And okay, I see mm -hmm. your question. So you're saying that this should be pretty clo closely related to the the latitude and longitude is what you're saying? Yeah, I don't know what what the like. If it was me, I'd, I'd fit it with just the neighborhood. I don't know what the marginal benefit would be of the latitude and the, the decimal of the location would be. I, honestly, I think it was mostly to show the techniques. Is what he's, I mean, I don't know. There's probably some cases where it matters. Um, but uh, like, uh, I don't think, I don't think that was his point. <laughs> you know, I don't think he went into whether it really matters. Yeah. Okay. The thing that, um, I don't know if it's clear when you get through the chapter, but the thing that's really nice about recipes is then when you come back with new data, 
you just put it through the recipe and like, like it does all the things, you know, you don't have to, I mean, you don't have to be particularly careful. <laughs> Shouldn't be, I'm not saying you should be sloppy, but it does, you know, it makes sure that every time you have data coming in, assuming it comes in the same as what you trained on, uh, it does whatever transformations you have just by like running these functions, this one, basically one function. Um, so that's cool. Right. And that's embedded in the model fit, right? So if you fit a, a, a model it's object. In, I believe it's in no, bake, right? it's, yeah, you have to run the bake and we'll eventually get to, they have workflows that put everything together. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, like, I, this is like a weird side tangent. Um, like, okay, let's say you created a, a, a model in R and you have to deploy it to SQL and you did like transformations on your training data set. Well, whenever you send in new uh, like records to get scored, well, you have to do the exact same transformations with that training data set. So like, you know, crappy practices, like, okay, well, I got to save that training data set exactly how it is with its transformations. And then you have to write the function that says, okay, new record for this value, scale it, in whatever the exact same way that you had it in your training data set. Otherwise, like if you just send in the, the raw value, it's like, well, now you're multiplying something that isn't apples to apples and it's, <laughs> it gets really messy and it's, it's less than fun. It's painful. So yeah, good stuff. And there are so like a billion steps that they've written. Um, I think the book has a link to, there's a spot on tidy models where they like just keep a list of all the, the steps. So do you actually have to run the steps on your, on your test set before you feed it to your model? Is that what you're saying? Um, by baking it, you are running all the steps on your test set. Okay, got it. Or if you, if you create a workflow, that will do all the work for you. Yep. If hmm. not, then you would have to bake your test using the calculations you did on the training. Yep. And what if you have like, can you, I, I guess like I'm wondering, is there any difference really between doing a bunch of steps uh, with the recipes package versus doing the same things with like dplyr? Um, like um, well, write, the... write the function to do it in, in, in dplyr and like, cause it, it seems to me, and I, I may not entirely understand, but it seems to me like you're just defining steps, transformations to a, the training data set. I don't quite understand prep you, and bake, I guess. So, so yeah, the, when you prep the recipe, um, the, the special thing that, that matters there, that it makes it not just running like a pipeline is um, let's say that you're doing PCA, it defines um, what the principal components are even for the training or for the test data so that they do the same transformation that you did to the training data um, or anything else that it like that it learns from the training data let's even if it's like uh, the um, taking the top classes um, was it um, step other where it gets rid of the the infrequent classes it'll do that same step other on your test data or on any new data that you have that comes in um, even if the balance is different in your test data. Right, so in that case, it's looking up the exact levels. Right. And assigning those on those. In, so it's looking at the levels in the training set that were low end, finding those in the test set and assigning those as other, even if those levels in the test set are the number one value. In right. In terms of frequency. Yeah. Which you in your test data existed. shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be that case in, in your test data, but in new data, you never know down the road what might turn out to be frequent. Right. Yeah, I was just choosing an yeah. extreme example. So maybe that's the purpose of the resampling because then you're hoping to get like a different mix each time. And then he actually averages the, the R square across all the resamples. So maybe that gives him the strength of uh, how that interaction is <clears throat> by using multiple resamplings. Yes. So um, if we look 
two chapters from now, I think is the, it's where we get into workflows. And that was the package that once that came out, everything started to kind of click of, oh, this is what tidy models is. I get it. So we've got a couple more before we get into the super clean uh, processing. Um, but yeah, <laughs> recipes is a big one for sure. Obvious, like clearly from <laughs> the huge number of slides. Thank you very much, Pavitra. Okay, hey, Yvette, um, I didn't get into juice here, but I think that's probably something that is gonna be further down downstream. I mean, juice really is just, um, it's like bake with new data equals null. It's It just pulls the training set out of a prepped recipe. So it's, it's basically like saying uh, bake, but new data set to null is the same as saying juice on your I, recipe. I mean, I'm, right? I'm making sure that no one's saying I'm wrong in the, Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think that he kind of dumped juice because it was only confusing. Um, it makes way more sense to me that it's bake without new data. So I'm glad he added that. Um, he went a little overboard with the uh, cooking metaphors, in my opinion. <laughs> And yeah, uh, Tony pointed out tiny models before workflows was an experience. <laughs> that is very true. So we got two more chapters and then hopefully it'll be a lot clearer. Um, but getting this baseline is definitely useful because I mean, you still are gonna, we're still gonna be writing recipes. It's just how you use them all together is uh, coming soon. And so on, I saw oh, something interesting. Um, is it is it Yanni? Do I pronounce your name Yanni, or I don't want to say it wrong? You are um, Yanni, right, Yanni? Yeah, <laughs> it is Yanni, right? So he says the reference level isn't lined up with how base R is defined. So you need to be careful. I ran a logistic regression and got into all kinds of trouble with how. So like, is this related to the the interactions, or is that something else? Uh, I was just trying to. Uh, I was just looking at the chat now, so I didn't know what the reference level was related to. That was um, in reference to a uh, step dummy. The step dummy. Yeah, okay. because it 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 um, creates dummy variables but drops the reference level, right? Because if you would keep the reference level as well, then you would have a linear combination between predictors, and some models would not like that. Um, so that's what we were talking about. How do you how do you pick that reference level? So that would be right up with the intercept rate. Is that's what it would be if you actually had all the levels. Right, right. So earlier we were talking about, hey, what is this intercept, right? So that would be a reference level. And then the conversation was how does a recipe picks the reference yeah. level? And I think we agreed that uh, whatever your factor level is, the ascending or descending, I forgot which one it was. It will pick I think it's alphabetic. Is it, it alphabetic or is it? Um, I know for cat. Yeah, because if it's a, if it's a character vector, it will make it a factor, and then uh, yeah. right. it, might, it might set the levels um, in alphabetical order. But if you wanted one particular level as your reference, you can reorder your factor or relabel re it, and then that will be your reference. Got it. Cool. <clears throat> The veneer of the big data board determines the pronunciation. Asma. <laughs> yeah, congrats. Asma versus Tony. Yeah, uh, congrats, Asma. That's awesome. And Tony. And Tan, or and Tony, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was, so this chapter uh, has been kind of dangerous in that in going through this, they mentioned tidy re or uh, mixed recipes, which I had done a little bit of work on way back when, and I found a ticket, like it led me to find a ticket that I'm working on closing in that recipe or in that package now. So new steps coming soon to text recipes. Um, but yes, so we need someone to do seven. Who wants to do parsnip? Did we sign someone out on that already? I can't remember. Let me look. Um, we do not have anyone signed up. So who wants to do it? 
Oh, so Daniel uh, definitely doesn't want to do it if he has his prelims next week, I guess. <laughs> Asma wants to make parsnip puree. <laughs> Right. Well, who hasn't who hasn't done anything yet? Let's see. We should just start. It's interesting. Eighty percent of the chat is related to the the reference level. I mean, that's <laughs> that's really always something that like takes up the maximum uh, bandwidth. It's kind of confusing. <laughs> I feel like we should start like voting for each other. You know, without, like, now we have to have like a game where, you know, you got to get on people's good sides so that you don't get voted to uh, do a presentation. I, we haven't had to go there yet, <laughs> but uh, who, come on, someone wants to do it, right? How about uh, Tyler? You want to do it, Tyler? You haven't gone yet, right? I don't know if he's listening. No one wants to step up. Oh, people are going to drop off of the chat now. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll figure it out in the, the Slack. I I really don't want to, but I will if I have I'll, to. I'll volunteer as tribute. Uh, All right. Thank let's, you, Jordan. Let's, let's, let's do this. Um, awesome. <laughs> I guess I will be in touch with you, John. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I will talk to you on the Slack. Um, I, I would like to encourage you to try to make it feel more slide like we're drifting away into like a book. Yep. And I want it to be more of just bullet points. Um, but it's hard sometimes because you want to show code. And I can't I haven't looked at this one yet. Um, but it's parsnip. So it's probably going to be even though it's only five sections. It's probably going to be really dense. Um, so yeah, <laughs> cool. Let's do it. All right. Thanks. All right. All right. Anyone have oh. anything else? Oh, did we lose? Uh, no. Okay. Um, well, cool. It was good to see everybody. This is a tough chapter. Like, uh, I, Definitely recommend, you know, talk in the channel if there's anything that isn't clear, because it's a dense chapter and an important chapter, because this is how you get your data ready so you can model. So um, if you don't, if you don't grok it yet, let's keep talking. <laughs> and you had, so the short version prep is just get your recipe ready. So it's use your training data to set up any steps that need things to be set up and then bake is process data so whether it's baking nothing to get your training or your uh, your processed training data back or you bake test data to get your processed testing data or you bake new data to get new data bake is just is actually use the recipe um but you know we can go over that over and over because it is definitely confusing took me a long time to understand what the difference was. For one thing, when you prepare a meal, sometimes you bake the meal. It's like it's those words are not that different, but okay, it's the prep step before you actually do the baking. All right. Yeah, you know, the part that was not intuitive to me, it's, it's weird and I only encountered this at the end, is why you feed that whole thing back to, um, excuse me one second, um, to LM, like, like I, I was a little bit confused by that. You know what I mean? Like the part where you have your prepped um, test data set, uh, I mean, your, your training data set, and you actually right. stick it back into LM. And well, it just because seems like you the recipe is everything that happens before you train the model. It's just getting your data ready to use in the model. And so LM is, it was a shortcut for what we're going to look at next week in, in the parsnip chapter. But you need to first, prep your data or, or bake your data, including the training data. And then you use that in LM or whatever model that you want to use, use it in. Um, 
So, even, so, so you're not really sense. away from the formula thing. Like, so even though you've defined your formula in your recipe, you still feed it back to the formula. Like, yeah. it seems a little bit. Confusing. Yeah. Well, just because he's trying to show us in, um, without using parsnip, it'll make more sense once we're oh. using parsnip. I think, I think the reason you you have the formula and the recipe is just to identify your predictors and outcome. I think that's, right. that's the only reason you use formula there so that the, your recipe knows what's your predictor because some of the steps you can say all predictors minus or, or all minus outcome or something like that. So how would the recipe know what's predictor and what's outcome? Right. right. So when you define that with the tilde, that's where it knows what's the outcome and what's predictor. Yes. Would it, would it be more clear if there's just like a, a variable for predictor and then you could put your predictor variable because I've had that same problem where it looks like the formula is there so it feels like it's fitting but but it's not well he, he has the role function yeah. in there yeah. right like hey Agile there are reason. defined roles for like uh right. you know vectors inside your data frame so like a defined role is like this is my this is dependent variable this is independent variable this is id ID is a good one to say like, okay, maybe it's a useful thing I want to aggregate and do something by, but like not have it be part of like the prediction at all. Um, so I think he solves that with roles. Right. Yep. But like in, but, you could fill on role mm -hmm. predictor at the top instead of here's a formula, then define my ID. Then uh, you're getting to the same thing. It's just, I've, I've had that same con confusion that Pavitra had mentioned. There's a formula here. So it looks like it's, it's trying to fit it. I right. think the roles are, are being fed from the formula. Right. You can yep. add more roles later. Yeah, also with formula, it's easy. You just give a dot and then you capture all the predictors. Just imagine if you had like hundreds mm -hmm. of them, you don't want to be typing that. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So if you have like in my housing model, I have like, like 20 variables. I just use the dot for everything with the predictor. And then I would add roles if I had like lat long. I'd add a role for geo of uh, the parcel ID, that'd be uh, the role for ID. And then, then you could use, use those, all, all the nominal, all, mm -hmm. all the other ones. Yes. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Yeah, just to, to repeat that, that the formula that you use in the recipe is only to define predictors and outcomes and really by the way, when you use a formula in LM, that's also what it's doing. It's not doing the fit. It's saying this is the predictor and this or this is the outcome and these are the predictors. So it's really doing the same thing, but it's more explicit in recipes that that's what it's doing. Mm 